When his homeland erupted in war, he witnessed one of the greatest atrocities of modern time, the Rwandan genocide. He gathered his strength and his family and rescued over 1,200 people from certain death. He negotiated, bartered, and risked it all while living the nightmare that inspired the film Hotel Rwanda. Hello, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with modern-day hero Paul Resusabagina. Was there ever a peaceful period that you remember in that country? Well, there was a kind of uh, peace between 19, around 1980 and 1986-7, somewhere there. But around 1986, when the rebels took power in Uganda, when they put Museveni into power, for people who can see far, the next country to be conquered was Rwanda. And this even came out in many newspapers. The General Habyarimana's government, the former president, also started working on it. Around 1988, uh, the president was becoming as someone who had no more people around him. He had, he had what we call a kazoo. That was just a small house around him of his family. And there's a few close friends. 1988-9, many news, foreign newspapers started writing about the Rwandan dictatorship. 1990, the war started. And I was there. I saw the war. And I saw so many people being victimized. 1993, a kind of radio, a hate radio, actually, was founded by the president himself, his government officials, some extremists, uh, intellectuals, and business prom uh, prominent businessmen, even, including even university professors. That was a radio which was supposed to convey their message. And the message was this, was to dehumanize Tutsis. Because in most cases, people who came from, from Uganda were the rebels who attacked Rwanda in 1990. They were actually Tutsis. Who Explain went a little bit the, for the audience who the Tutsi are and the Hutu and how they came to be. Well... Early, no, late 1800s, around 1890, Rwanda became a German colony. And in order to, in order to, to rule, Germans had to find allied. And their allied, they took Tutsis. They used to say that Tutsis are the elite. They are smarter. They are, they are more or less like Europeans. So they ruled the country with Tutsis. And Tutsi were the portion of the population uh, that ab were... About 15% of Lighter the skinned, thinner yeah. noses, things Which like was that. not actually a fact, a matter of fact. Because there are many Hutus who look like Tutsis and many Tutsis who, like, who look like Hutus. And uh, there are many taller Hutus than Tutsis. So, but it was just an arbitrary separation yes, then? Yes, so it was just an arbitrary separation. And uh, many times, Hutus who had many cows were also, who were wealthy, were also taken to be Tutsis. Because initially, um, the word Hutu means someone who works for another person who is employed by another person. Mm -hmm. That is what it means. And this was even written in the IDs, well, the Germans are the ones who taught people how to write, how to read and write. 
they are then the ones who wrote, who reproduced those what are ethnic separation in the identification cards. They were even measuring fingers, people's fingers, and their noses and everything to say who, this one is a Hutu, the other one is a Tutsi, the other one is a Tua. And then in 1923, after the First World War, Belgians took over. The Germans lost the war, and Rwanda was given to Belgium as a protectorate, under protectorate. When Belgium took over, they did never change anything. They also ruled with the same elite, minority, or the population. So when, during the independence, for the independence time, Belgians left Rwanda and Tutsis as well in 1959. And so then this separation is already built then, into the culture. Uh, yes. And there is the Hutu are in power now, but they're angry at the Tutsi. Yeah, they're angry. They have been angry against Tutsis and Europeans, colonizers. So when they took over the power in 1959, 60, 61, 2, they took the whole of it. As it belonged two colonizers in Tutsis before. Then when Tutsis came back in 1990 in a rebellion, fighting, they also came almost alone fighting for power. In 1994, after the genocide, Tutsis won the war. When they also won the war, they took the whole of it. So in Rwanda, it is all either you have it all or you've got nothing. This is how it is. Either you are up, standing, or you are lower, you are down on the ground. You watched this happen. You watched the genocide begin. And you're married to a Tutsi and you're Hutu. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And so, in a sense, you had to protect your wife. Yes, of because course. Because she would have been on the hit list, in a sense. Yeah. And you take them all to where you work, to your hotel. Before I take before taking my wife, the second day of the genocide, I had twenty six refugees in my house. So before taking my wife and children to the hotel, I also had to take those people with. That is why you see in the movie, that scene you can see. I kept him hand, handing me over a gun to shoot my cockroaches. That is a true story of what happened. The cockroaches are the people that were yeah, with Yeah, they you. are the people, dehumanized people. He actually, he handed me a gun and told me, listen, you traitor, we are not killing you today. You are lucky we are, because the government has sent us to pick you up and bring you to the hotel. But have a gun and kill all of your cockroaches here. And all along the road, there were many dead bodies. You could see with your own eyes, dead bodies. And people crying in, a, in, in many different houses, being killed, butchered. You take the people. You take them to the hotel for yeah. safety's sake, to get them away from what's going on. And at that point, do you have any plan? Do you know what you're doing, or is it just getting from moment A to moment B? Actually, at that, at that moment, I was not sure of anything. I, did, I was not sure of anything. We had stayed for, with those people for almost three days. In, and I was, I was just acting hour after hour, an hour after an hour to see, to see whether we can go to get, reach the next step and reach the hotel. And after negotiating with those guys, after two hours, I took my people, my wife, um, my wife, children, and uh, the, the refugees who were in my house. I took them into the hotel. And now while this is going on, the massacre is happening all around you. Yes. All around, all around even the hotel, people were butchering people. You could see people moving around 
with the red machetes, 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 machetes with the blood. And it was simply the Hutu killing the Tutsi. Oh, they were simply Hutus killing Tutsis, and uh, a few Tutsis also joined the mob, but, but uh, very few. Now, at the same time, the UN is there because they're supposed to be keeping the peace or monitoring the peace or however they ended up wording it. Are they any relief to you? Do they actually help you in any way or is it just symbolic? Actually, it was maybe it could have been better for the United Nations not to be there than having been there. What I mean to say is this. When people, other people, were very much afraid, late 1993, they knew they were going to be butchered. But when they saw the United Nations coming in, they, be, they were a little bit confident because no one can kill people in front of foreigners. They said, now we are going to be protected. We can stand strong and uh, at least for once say the truth and face Abiyanimana, the president. Then they stayed in Rwanda. Many people were ready to go to Uganda, to go to Congo, to go to Burundi and wait, wait and see what was going to follow. But when the genocide broke out, on the 7th, 10 Belgian soldiers were butchered. They were killed. And when they were killed, immediately Belgium decided to pull out. When Belgium decided to pull out, they were backed by the United States and England as well. So the last decision, which was taken for the, rest, for the very first week of the genocide, was for the United Nations to pull out because they did not want, according to what I can think, they did not want to face the Somali experience, the Black Hawk Down, which was also very fresh in American minds. So the United Nations pulled out. Many people had gathered in schools, in school buildings. They were protected by United Nations soldiers. The day, the very time they were pulling out, the United Nations withdrawing Immediately, the butchers, the killers, were just surrounding those schools and churches. So to me, it would have been be better for the United Nations not to be there at all than coming and withdrawing. Because withdrawing was meant to say, to tell the killers that now, even as we are afraid of you, you are the winners. You are, you are stronger than us. Just go ahead, do your job. You said earlier how you had 20-some-odd people with you when you went into the hotel. That number continued to grow. There were more and more refugees that were coming to the hotel. How big did that group get? Well, at the end, I had 1,268 people staying in the Mikolin Hotel. How did you take care of all these people? How did you keep it from getting out of hand? Well, I was negotiating. That was my first weapon, negotiating with the leaders. I knew the general chiefs of staff, the generals. I was in contact with them. I was in contact even with the vice president of uh, the militia. I was talking to him very often. All of those people were coming to the hotel, having even a drink. And then many times we could uh, negotiate and I gave them a, a small curtain for, or something and that was it. And every moment was just moment to moment? Yes, but I also had my own informants. Because many times the hotel was attacked. And before it was attacked, I was always informed. 
I had a lot of contacts in Rwanda and abroad. So whenever I was sensing something wrong somewhere, I could always phone each and every one. And many times I was even not able to phone. And whenever I was un unable to phone, I could always draft a fax and send a fax. Disturbing people was not my problem. Even myself, I was not sleeping. And sometimes I could wake people up and talk to them, but they said, they say, Am I, were you sleeping? I'm sorry. Myself having slept for the last whole week or two weeks. <laughs> I could disturb people sleeping, sending or like calling them on the phone. I could stay 20, 20 hours without sleeping. As a father, how did you keep your children calm? Or at the moment like that, is that the last thing you're trying to do? Uh, my children were grown-ups at the time. My elder daughter was 16 years old. She could see what was going on. She was aware of what was going on. My son, who you have seen him in a movie, Rogers, he was 14 years old. He was also a grown-up. He couldn't keep quiet. But surprisingly, their younger brother, who was, two, who was a one and a half years old, did never make any noise. When they went to hide in the bathroom, he never the militia came, broke the door, they entered the room, and the, the, the street, in the living, the, the bedroom, they went to the toilet. Everywhere, it, the house was, the, the whole suite was open except the bathroom where they were, and that boy did not make any single simple noise. You can't believe it. Yeah. But what did you think while all of this is going on? What was going through your mind? I mean, in some way, I'm assuming you had to be thinking of some sort of a plan. There had to be some sort of way to solve all of this, to get through it. At a, at a time, I didn't have any plan because we can never have a plan for 1,000 people. And uh, as you can see, and you have seen in the movie, at a given time, as, since I was a neighbor, to leave, to take my wife and children and leave the hotel, I knew that those people were going to be killed. And the day I was hunting, I had within, in, within my mind, I had an idea that, that this one day would be over. And when it would be over, I'll have to face history. So I said to myself, that I was going to stand strong and stay in the hotel. One day, there was an evacuation. I never left. My wife and children, they went. I closed the truck. They left. But I remained behind. Right, it had been arranged for them to get the family out, to get yes. some selected people out. Yes. And everyone thought you were going to go, but... You sent your family on to stay with the people, the refugees that had no yeah, else I to go. I stayed with them. Unfortunately, even those ones who left, you know, who went, who evacuated, did not go far. Yeah. And they returned back to the hotel? They returned back to the hotel, but I'm almost dead. They were beaten, injured. That, the, whole truck, the whole truck was full of blood. Of blood. My wife was not able to turn in the bed, just turning in the bed for two weeks. I've said, watching the film back, that there mm. are points where I just, I can't make it through. I just want to break out and cry because I think, how much more can someone endure? Yet you lived all of this. There had to be times when you just thought, I can't do this anymore. I am just totally exhausted. At moments like that, what kept you moving forward? Well, fortunately, I didn't have time to think about that. Because each and every single minute, each and every hour, represented a danger. I always had to act, to not work and work very, and be, I'll go ahead of them. So I didn't, I didn't have time to be discouraged as such. 
And actually, sometimes you can be discouraged because you think that someone else, somewhere, can do what you are doing. Since you are the only person doing it, you've got no choice. You have to do it. There's a scene in the film where you're driving on a road, can't see what's going on because of the fog, and the road gets bumpy and you assume you've driven off the road. But it turns out it's because it's littered with dead bodies everywhere. Is that a real moment? No, that is not a real moment. That is just a compilation of all the stories representing dead bodies all over the roads that uh, I told the film writers and then they wrote in. What they, they put show, it that way. What they show in that scene, though, is that realistic of what you would have seen on the streets? Well, but you, can, uh, you have also seen another footage from a documentary which was brought by a journalist by Joaquin Phoenix. You have seen it. That is a real footage of what was happening. But you can, know, you can never show on a screen what took place in Rwanda. It was horror. You can never show that horror on the TV, on a screen. No one will come and watch it. That was even happening around the hotel. I'll give you an example. On the 17th of June, 1994. This all happened in 100 days, correct? Yeah. I was with a... First of all, I knew that people were being killed at the St. Fami Church. The St. Fami is a church which is at about 150, you know, three, 400 meters from the, from the Mikolin Hotel, just in the neighborhood, in the neighborhood. I knew they were killing people. I met the mayor of Kigali, and I told who was a colonel in the army. I told him, Colonel, I need soldiers to come and protect this hotel. He told me, no, Paul, you know, I don't have soldiers to come here. All the soldiers are gone, are gone on war. And um, I don't have police, um, um, policemen. I, please try to do with uh, your own means. I looked at him, I faced him and told him, Colonel, one day, all of this we see will be over. You and I will face history. Me, I'll feel free within my conscience. Are you sure you feel free? Honest? He was ashamed, of course, and he left. But I had an appointment with his boss, General Bizimongo, at the Diplomat Hotel, as you can see in the movie. I went to the diplomat when I was informed that militia have broken into the Mikonin Hotel. When they entered the hotel, I was immediately informed. I was standing with him in the diplomat cellars. I told him, General, let us go down to Mikolin. We immediately came down to Mikolin. When we came, the Militia had broken many of the doors, starting by mine. They had taken many people down around the swimming pool. People were kneeling, waiting, some crying, waiting for their death. They were, those guys were, um, they had weapons and weapons. Machetes, clubs, what I, uh, uh, keratin cups, pistols, whatever, whatever weapon we can think of. But uh, the general is the one, the only one, who came and said, and then he told one of his bodyguards and said, Sergeant, go there, up there, and tell all of those militia who are in this hotel that whoever will kill someone, I'll kill him. Whoever we shoot, I'll kill him. Whoever will remain in this hotel for the next five minutes, I'll kill him. He went himself up and down and got them out. Of the 1,200 plus people that were in the hotel with you, how many made it out okay? Everybody was... The Hotel de Mikolin actually has been an exception. The Hotel de Mikolin is... Uh, I can say the only place where many people were hiding 
and nobody has killed has been killed nobody was taken out nobody was even beaten from that beginning to the end and in that 100 days a million people practically were killed about 15% of the population of the Rwandan population was exterminated within 100 days when people refer to you as a hero how does that sound to you well to me it doesn't sound right because me i'm not a hero i'm someone who did his job you can take me as a hotel manager who has been a, maybe a good hotel manager who fulfilled his duties the way he was supposed to do his duties from the beginning to the end shall we conclude that whoever does his job as he's supposed to do it is a hero well i would say you went a little bit beyond the call of duty there <laughs> that is a there's a call of duty yeah well i just want to say thank you so much for your story truly inspirational on the work you did yeah welcome thank you very much thanks paul rosessa begina thank you Order a transcript call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Music